Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. As you're listening to this, we will either be hitting the very, very end of October or beginning to roll into November of 2021. Amazing that we've made it so far through the year, this far through the year, and uh, heading into the home stretch into the last couple of months of the year. Hope everybody is doing well. Hope everybody is staying warm if you're in a part of the country like I am that is beginning to get cold. And, uh, you know, today on this Sunday perspective, I want to dive a little bit into something that's, um, you know, been a very interesting area to sort of watch. And, uh, you know, I saw a couple of things come out of a couple of events here recently, some stuff out of KubeCon, but also, um, you know, looking back at some some threads that I saw, some stuff that was written by Red Monk and so forth, which is really about developer experience. And developer experience is a really interesting thing because um, on one hand, everybody sort of comes to the agreement that, uh, you know, a couple of things. Number one, um, you know, having productive developers, having creative developers can be a huge, um, you know, important thing to your business, right? More and more what we do is digital, more and more what we do is driven by software. And so the ability to sort of uh, harness that power, if you will, have that uh, capability available to you and, and be able to use it in really powerful ways um, is an, you know, an important business advantage if you can take advantage of it. So we all sort of agree on that. And then, you know, there's this general agreement that, you know, in order to make developers productive, um, so instead of giving them, you know, a million tools, if you will, and letting them all go uh, do their thing, since developers in many cases have to work collaboratively, you know, they should probably work on some sort of a platform with, you know, something should be there provided to them that is, uh, you know, foundational, that they can build upon, that gives them access to self-service, that takes care and hides a lot of things. You know, there's a lot of folks who kind of agree with that sentiment, if you will, the idea that, um, you know, the more that we can do to sort of hide complexities of things for developers um, and allow them to be productive and not have to deal with sort of the crap, if you will, um, that would be a great thing. And what's really interesting to me is while the industry at large generally agrees to those two things, the second part, they can't really agree to. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, Oftentimes, uh, you know, and I know James Governor from Red Monk mentioned this uh, a little while ago, and he said, you know, everybody at some point always starts off with good intentions, and then at some point they eventually are trying to rebuild Heroku. And what's really interesting to me is, uh, yes, that's true. Uh, if you look at all these sort of things that are being built, and we'll dig into this a little bit more detail, they they all eventually come back to the idea of, I want to build something that allows developers to have a very simple model of writing their code, um, oftentimes which they don't even touch, uh, but you know, eventually getting it into production and, and not having the the sort of all the nuances and details and infrastructure and plumbing and security and all that stuff kind of exposed to them. But on the other hand, you know, we talk about Heroku as if they're the Beatles, right? They were this amazing thing that they were, uh, you know, the iPhone. And yet, you know, Heroku these days uh, isn't a, a huge thing. It was sort of a you know, this Trojan horse, if you will, or this myth of what was this great experience, but yet not enough things really took off in that space. And so what I'd kind of like to dig into in this Sunday perspective is, um, you know, why we have this fascination in our industry of trying to want to always build platforms, whether it's something that a SaaS service builds or a vendor builds or whatever, or companies uh, try and build themselves, which we see happening over and over again, but yet nobody ever makes repeatable platforms. Nobody ever can kind of, there is no one formula for that. And I want to kind of dig into why that happens, why we're still chasing that, uh, that sort of, uh, that unicorn, if you will, and uh, you know, what, what that might mean for our industry going forward. So we're going to get to that right after the break. And we're back. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're going to dive a little bit into this sort of premise that I have that, you know, developer platforms are, have have and are always the rage. People are always trying to find ways to to build things that are going to help developers to hide things from developers. We have new tools that come out that are going to you know developers have to do less and worry about less. We talked about like uh, you know Wasm last week and uh, WebAssembly and all that sort of stuff. And you know at the end of the day that becomes yet another thing that sort of abstracts some stuff. We've been through PaaS, we've been through Docker, we've been through containers, we've been through serverless. But, you know, we keep coming back to this, this idea of, you know, we, we want to build a, a platform. Somebody wants to build a platform because, again, the goal is, 
you know, make developers as productive as possible. These people are going to, you know, have the ability to reshape your business, to reshape how you deal with data, how you deal with a market, how you expose your business to the world and so forth. Um, and yet, you know, we keep coming back to this idea of, of building platforms. And it's, you know, it's kind of curious to me. I, I was reading some follow-ups from, from uh, KubeCon and uh, one of the, you know, one of the articles that was written was, you know, sort of key takeaways from KubeCon. And it talked about, hey, we're having, um, you know, developer experience is now a really important part of this. And it was really interesting to me because, you know, KubeCon in particular is sort of an interesting lighthouse, if you will, for the space, because, uh, you know, Kubernetes kind of came out of this need to uh, make it easier uh, not, you know, easier in a, in a you know, quote sense to use containers. Containers were there to help developers be productive so that they could, you know, same thing they did on their desktop could be run in production. Um, and yet, you know, Docker by itself, if you go back to the sort of the shows we did on Docker, Docker had a pretty interesting experience uh, for developers. Now, it wasn't perfect, but they focused very much on that, right? It was very much the Apple approach, the Docker company, very much the Apple approach, trying to make it simpler to use these abstractable tools, if you will. And then Kubernetes came along and made it really complicated because it was going to be done by a lot of people. And, uh, you know, it was expected that you understood, you know, not only all the orchestration stuff, but then the container stuff. But, you know, it never really focused on developer experience. And we've seen some things over time uh, kind of uh, move that forward, right? We saw sort of the PaaS movement come out of uh, and sort of in parallel to Kubernetes, right? It was before Kubernetes, it was Heroku, it was App Engine, it was Cloud Foundry, it was early versions of OpenShift. And then we've seen, you know, things sort of after, um, you know, afterwards sort of PaaS on top of of Kubernetes now, you know, OpenShift and Tanzu and other types of things. And some people, you know, appreciate that, uh, the abstractions, you know, build packs and other stuff like that. And others, you know, still live with this idea of, nope, we're going to, we're going to build our own platform on top of it. And, you know, it's, it's just sort of interesting to me because, you know, in a perfect world, um, you know, there would be things, you know, the platform would, um, allow, you know, things to be invisible for developers. They wouldn't have to think about IP addresses and VLANs and, uh, namespaces and subnets and, uh, load balancers and ingress and egress and all that stuff. Right. So we, we agree on that, but, you know, the challenge that always comes up is that, platforms sort of by definition have opinions, right? In order to be able to make something that's going to make it something easier for somebody else, you have to uh, reduce the options. You need to have opinions and have limitations. And eventually uh, the downside of that is Mm -hmm. number one, um, that starts to align your platform to only a certain set of use cases or a certain set of patterns or a certain language or whatever that might be. Um, you know, containers were helpful with that because they could support any language, right? Unlike some of the early passes that were Ruby only or .NET only or Java only. So we, we've found some ways to get around that, but still at the end of the day, there's going to be some limitations. Um, and, you know, whatever decisions go into those limitations, those opinions, somebody's going to have to maintain that platform, right? And that somebody could be a SaaS service, it could be your internal IT team, it could be the developers themselves, the sort of you build it, you run it type of thing. But then at some point, you know, the the unlimitedness gets narrowed by the limitations of the opinions, and then maybe it gets even narrowed even more because somebody goes, I don't need seven databases that are available as a service. I just need like two or three. I can't maintain that many of them. All right, so we get into that that sort of interesting sort of way of dealing with all that stuff. Now, the flip side of that is, developers don't love to have their tools dictated to them. They don't love to have the opinions dictated to them, right? If you're a company who, you know, does everything one way, so maybe you are, uh, you know, entirely built around Java and Spring Boot, okay, you probably can can build an opinionated platform and do some pretty interesting things around that. But as soon as you start saying, well, we need to do some stuff in Python for the data, data science people, and we're going to do some stuff... Um, you know, in uh, JavaScript, or we're going to do some stuff in for the mobile teams, right? Or we're going to do some stuff for for whoever else. Then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, do we expand the opinions? Do we not expand the opinions? So, to a certain extent, the developers don't like to have their tools limited to them. They actually don't mind the fact that there are literally hundreds and hundreds of tools, because just like anybody who's done like a remodeling project in their house. You know, there's going to be times when you're like, I need a saw, but I don't need that saw. I need one that's a little bit different. I need a hammer, but not the small hammer. I need the big giant hammer to knock a hole in the wall. Or I need this thing that kind of just scrapes stuff, right? And 
you know, you'll go into the toolbox and you'll be like, there's a hundred tools in there. I may not use them all, but there's going to come a time when you sort of need to use one. And so on one hand, the developers don't mind all that because they know that, hey, if I have access to these tools, and again, they could be an open source tool or something they built or some community member thing or a teammate used, you know, they don't mind all those things, but they don't like their tool to be dictated to them. They don't like necessarily to have somebody say, we're only going to do things this way, right? And and so it's it's this constant trade-off that we have between, um, you know, A, we, we want to make them productive. One of the ways to make them productive at a scale, not just an individual developer, but at scale, is to do it with platforms. Um, platforms tend to have opinions. And so what that ends up me being is, you know, one of a couple of things happen. Number one is we end up having a bunch of individual platforms. And, you know, on one hand, you go, well, that's not great because if you have a whole bunch of platforms and somebody has to maintain them, maybe, right? But what you're seeing, you know, especially in the SaaS space, right? We see things like NetLafly and we see um, Jamstack capabilities from from different vendors or, you know, for different SaaS tools. And we see, uh, you know, GraphQL being offered as a service. And we see all these sort of things being offered, you know, so maybe nobody really maintains those, right? It's just maintained as a service. And so you don't have to care who maintains them. And to a certain extent, you know, maybe you still want to use Heroku. Maybe you want to use something that's Jamstack. Maybe you want to use something that's NetLafly. Maybe you want to use something that's, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and you don't think about them as platforms anymore, right? So that's one path that we have to get around this, right? The other, uh, you know, other sort of way to get around this is, um, you know, to, to build broader platforms and just deal with, um, you know, the fact that uh, it's going to be broad. It's going to have a whole bunch of sort of broad capabilities, ways to do self-service, lots of languages will be supported. And to a certain extent, because more and more people are staying lesser lesser time in their jobs, right? We're seeing more people moving jobs. It's, it's really interesting to me that when you have conversations with companies and they start telling you that they're going to build their own platform, you know, it's very clear to you as you're talking to them that that person isn't staying more than two or three years, right? They'll stay to build the platform. They're building the platform to build their resume to a certain extent. Maybe they're going to solve a business problem, but they're staying to build the platform to gain skills that go on their resume so they can go find something else. And so that's the other sort of interesting rub in all this is that um, if you are building your own platform, um, you know, are you going to stay <laughs> to maintain that platform? Are you going to stay to deal with the technical debt of the choices that you make and so forth. And um, so that's really interesting is, you know, it, it seems to be we sort of have a couple of a couple of paths that are coming, right? There's there's the path of, you know, pick pick something based on maybe some vendor supported tools and and sort of cobble together some stuff, you know, CI and CD pipeline, software supply chain sort of stuff with security and source control and, um, you know, deployment tools and so forth. Um, and And there's, you know, some pretty common ways people can do that, but they're never necessarily the same in every company. Uh, build it yourself. And, you know, we're seeing more and more trends of those are very rarely the same. I mean, every time you talk to those, it's, well, we do this. Yeah, we, we do that thing where we, you know, we do source control and we try and hide things from the developer. And then we have some glue code and then we have some other glue code. And then we have this other stuff that we script some things for, and then it gets deployed. And then we add on a bunch of tools to monitor it. Right. So, those are always Frankenstein's and you're never sure who's going to actually maintain those long term. Or, you know, maybe what we're really going to see is beginning to see more and more of, you know, adoption of not a single platform, but multiple and just deal with the fact that you're going to offload who owns the platform to somebody else. Um, you're going to figure out maybe a, a platform of platforms, if you will, right A way to kind of keep track of whether you're using this platform, that platform, another platform, another platform. Um, I'm going to kind of keep track. I'm going to inventory those things somehow, but I'm going to kind of get rid of the the burden, the technical debt piece, because I'm just going to hand that off to somebody else. So it's really interesting to me to see how we keep coming back to the same problem space. We never really make a ton of progress on it. We make a ton of progress on hundreds of tools, new open source projects. Um, there are a lot of really good things that are happening, right? Like we're giving... You know, there, we've never seen, you know, more cloud-based tools. We've never seen more free tiers. We've never seen more SaaS capabilities. We've never seen more uh, public open source repositories that you can just go pull from. We've never seen more, uh, you know, awesome online demos and tutorials and training companies and all that sort of stuff. So on one hand, 
everything's awesome in terms of stuff being available to help the developers. And on the other hand, we keep coming back to this 10 year old problem we've had, which, you know, kind of originated when we started calling stuff Paz, or it was Heroku, or it was App Engine. And it was, I just want to, you know, make it simple for developers to do what they want to do and abstract everything away. But we've never quite gotten over the, the, the hurdle of, can you do that at scale? Can you do that with multiple use cases or multiple patterns or multiple languages and so forth? And Maybe that's a, a unicorn that we're going to chase forever, and we're never going to, you know, we're never going to kind of come to an end to. But it's interesting to watch the cycle start up over again and start over again and start over again because, you know, if you've been around this for you know more than a few years, and I've been sort of living this for probably at least ten years or so, um, you know, it's uh, we, we've seen these names before, we've seen these faces before, we've seen these problems before, and we keep trying to solve them in the same way, and you kind of keep wanting to come back to people and go here's how this movie's going to play out. Here's how it's going to end. So um, it's sort of an interesting thing to watch. Um, you know, I do think the SaaS options that are out there and some of the other things that are out there are helping. I think uh, it'll be interesting to watch people movement uh, as, as, as people stay lesser and lesser in jobs and move to other things and, um, you know, build a few things on their resume and move on. And, um, you know, but it's, it, to me, it's, it, we just haven't yet cracked the nut of, you know, how do you go about building these platforms? And maybe the question we should be asking ourselves is, um, you know, should I build one platform? Should I build 10 platforms? Should I not even think about platforms? Should I just think about individual applications? And we're thinking about how to keep track of those and manage those maybe at a more individualized level than, than the platform level. I don't know. It feels like there's sort of a reckoning that needs to happen again, maybe re getting back to first principles, asking questions about, you know, what, what are we, what are we ultimately trying to do? And if we've sort of stumbled and falled or made the same mistake over and over again for the last decade or so, probably decade plus in this platform space, um, you know, without having, without being able to reuse them, without being able to repeat them at, at different companies or different patterns, you know, is there a new way of thinking that needs to happen with this stuff? So anyways, uh, I'm going to kind of wrap it up there. Uh, I'm not going to dive in too, too deep. I put some interesting things in the show notes, both about kind of the trends that are happening, um, some some past thinking around this stuff, um, some interesting uh, ways that people look at how they build things like developer relations. So, you know, the, the grease that, that gets the wheels moving to help developers be able to use these tools, these platforms, learn about new stuff and Um, you know, sort of look at all those things. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, Hope you all are doing well. Hope you are uh, getting into November and getting ready for the holiday season and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, We had another very, very good uh, month here at the the Cloudcast. I think we were up about uh, 25% year over year. So thank you very much for telling a friend. Thank you for, um, you know, sharing the show with your friends. Thank you for, um, you know, just helping us grow it, you know, giving feedback, uh, shooting us a tweet, putting a a five-star review out on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else that you get your show. And uh, we're just thankful that you're out there. We Hopefully, we uh, we continue to provide something that's useful for you. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up, and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Cloudcast Basics. You can find all the show details at cloudcastbasics.net or in your favorite podcast player. 